Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. William Johnson to talk about ethnomusicology. William, welcome to the podcast. Hey, hey, hey. What's happening, everyone? Thank you, Bart, for having me. It's really good to have you here. We we uh, we only met a couple, like a week or so ago, a week or two ago through Instagram. And That's um, it. I'm very glad you reached out because um, I, I love when everyone reaches out, but sometimes it's it's more of like, hey, check out my drum video or like my thing. With you, it was, hey, I have, you know, I'm doing cool stuff and I checked out your page and your YouTube and it's like, yeah, this this dude is legit. <laughs> wow, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm very humbled and honored. I was actually just reaching out. I mean, it, I thought it would be cool to be on the show, but honestly, I listened to the show and I had, awesome. I'm I'm into what you talk about. So I was just reaching out like, hey, because I get it. You know, when you make content, sometimes you're just throwing it out there. Sure. And you don't know who's listening. So it's always really nice to get feedback from oh, some yeah. of those that are listening or watching. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, a, an attention to detail that I could tell and just like a, uh, a, a, a teacher's kind of brain in a way of like explaining things and going about it, um, which the, I pretty quickly... We were talking about things we could talk about and um, yeah. the topic of ethnomusicology, just in general, the like uh, that title is um, yeah. people may not know anything about it. So I think today we're going to talk about um, obviously ethnomusicology, what it is, how it relates to drumming, how it relates to other stuff as well, cultures, all kinds of stuff. So we got a lot of stuff to talk about. So how about we start off with just the definition of what it is? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and I'll give, I'll preface it with the best way we can truly define ethnomusicology, at least by, in the words of a lot of different scholars and academics, is probably in what various ethnomusicologists actually do, just like any sure. field, right? So if you're an electrician, we know there's a base, but you might be, it might be hard to define what you do. So we say that electrician over there does this, architectural, yeah. whatever. So yep. we, we know we have three words. It's a, it's a big word and it sounds intimidating, but really when you break it down to its definition, you have three words. So you have ethno, music, and ology, right? So you have mm -hmm. ethno, which is meaning, I believe it's Latin, but for people groups, right? So then you have the music, music, and then you have the ology, so the study of. Um, when you just look at all three of those, you can already see that this would be quite a thing to define because how do we even define music for eons? We've been trying to define that, you know, depending on your background, you may say, well, it's just what you listen to on the radio. But once you go around the world, you start finding out we even, uh, even in our own homes here in the United States, I, I believe you're in the U S as well. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. might, we might have commonalities of what we say music is, but even in different cultures here in the U S some genres we say, ah, that's not music. Or if you go to a mosque in the United States, certain prayers and chants may or may not be viewed as music as such. Like we say, commodities or entertainment on the yeah. radio. So music, even the definition, muse, Greek mythology. I mean, we're borrowing terms to even describe something that already exists. People groups, you have social constructs, you have ethnicity, you have heritage, very deep. You can go very deep, but at the same time, they start kind of crossing boundaries already. And then the study. So the study of something. So you have, how do you study it? Um, there's debates within that. There's methodologies, right? So basically, we can say that ethnomusicology is the study of culture within music. Okay. Mm. That's really at the base. But again, the more you even break down the semantics of that, we could talk about the definition for an hour and only end up more confused. But I think if you say <laughs> the culture of culture within music, I think is a pretty safe place to kind of start uh, pivoting yeah. from. Yeah. No, that's great because you summed it up very well. But as you said, it it then begs for more questions and examination of, of what, you know, which cultures, what exactly. music. It's exactly. like, how do you study it? It's all kinds of things like that. I mean, exactly. so then you your background in this let's talk about that a little bit and then what you focused on and kind of your areas of expertise a little bit um mm -hmm. it, it's so it's so interesting to see think even what got you into this it's got to be a little bit daunting at first a day one of class <laughs> to be oh, like man. wait what are we studying <laughs> yes and i i think that would tie in great with what us as drummers you know as percussionists um 
Now, depending on your background, and I'll tell you how I got into it was really I was doing the music and then I was, you know, I spent, I'll back up, just tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. I was sure. in the military for just under 10 years. I was in the United States Air Force. And when I got out, uh, I got married shortly after I got out of the Air Force and I was retraining. Uh, I was an aircraft mechanic and I did that as a civilian and in the Air Force. But I was also a homeowner, a new homeowner and settling down with a family. And my area didn't have a whole lot of going on with aviation, even though I loved it. But I was also doing music. And so, uh, you know, I had a GI Bill and just got out of the military. So, you know, spoke with my wife. We decided that, you know, after my contract ended with uh, the job that I was doing for the aircraft, because uh, I was a contractor, I decided to go back to school. And in going back to school, I was studying finance and history and ended up swapping those two to majoring in finance. I like to mm. tell people I was dating finance, but I was in <laughs> love with history. So I went ahead. My mother-in-law was like, why don't you just go ahead and major in, in history? You know, but my mind was like, why at that age, I was almost 30, you know? So I'm like, why would I major in something that I'm probably not going to make a whole lot of money in? You know? Yeah, really? So, but, yeah. but I knew that if I really loved it and I was creative enough, I would find a way, right? Sure. And, so I decided to major in history and I figured I would go into teaching. I love teaching. I've always loved teaching. I've always been teaching in some aspect. And so after my undergrad, I decided I wanted to also teach higher learning. Even though I teach, I was teaching little kids all the way up, I wanted to teach on a college campus. And you know, if you're going to do that, unless you have a Grammy, uh, unless you are have a really big name and then have a way in because the politics of, you know, academic yeah. institutions, you pretty much have to have a master's degree or higher, right? Yep. And so I decided to get my, you know, master's degree and then just keep plugging away, you know, gigging and and working while I was doing that, you know? So, um, which is funny because now I do that a little bit, but I actually get a lot of my jobs because of my gigs, <laughs> even mm. teaching oh, that's interesting. higher learning. But, but the master's degree was a door in. So sure. in a nutshell, I got into the ethnomusicology because of what I was doing with Afro-Cuban music, uh, West African music, um, being a percussionist, playing in gospel and funk. I was always adding the sounds and I was studying music from around the world. I was studying tabla from East India. And so when I heard about the ethnomusicology program, it was kind of after a while, it was a no brainer. It was like, yeah. I think I could teach anthropology which has the historical and the cultural aspect, which I love because I've sure. done a lot of traveling and I'm really big into people and cultures. And then it was the music aspect, the musicology, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was daunting for me though, because I didn't start off reading music. You know, I, I started off, I learned, I was self-taught at first. Um, I started off as a dancer, you know, salsa. Oh, wow. I was a dancer, a oh, well, hip hop first, and then I was a dancer. And then I started be playing the drums, what some consider later like 19 years old, uh, that was a segue into, you know, the, the salsa, the, uh, the whole, that whole, you know, scene. And then from there, starting to play the drums and playing the bands. But, um, but yeah, eventually that led into playing in bands, but I wasn't, you know, in the conservatory. So I wasn't reading music. But in the process of that, I started taking lessons and then learning how to read music. You know, as you progress... Yeah. It helps to at least be able to read a little bit. But the yeah. program, I was able to get into the program because of my recordings. So I was in the, you know, the Grammys as a voting member and hmm. doing a lot of session work. So because of that, I was able to get into the program. But the person that was letting me in warned me. He said, you have to have at least two years education-wise of piano. He said, there is going to oh. be some transcription. And we know... If you take percussion in school, if you have a music degree, you're going to have to do some piano. A lot of it's vibe, bass, marimba, or whatnot. Yeah, sure. So, so that was the daunting thing, Bart, is that I had to <laughs> learn how to sight read to a certain extent. I had to learn the music. And I got stories about that. I mean, as far as yeah. sitting in class, looking around, I'm the only guy <laughs> that doesn't have an undergrad in music. You know, and it was yeah. just like, that was yeah. very But it's good for you. It, it pushes you. It was very good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It pushed yeah. me. Yeah. Man, you're not a boring guy, that's for sure. I mean, there's a lot of different um, elements that make up 
you know, your background, um, which I think it all leads to this. But like that all leads to ethnomusicology of being very, I don't want to say broad, but it, it kind of has an open, it lets you do what you want a little bit. Um, you right. can study what you want, which you sent over some good bullet points, which I'm looking at here, which um, it's almost like you you have to choose a path to go because we could talk. You can't in an hour or whatever, talk about every single culture in the world and every single instrument they play. But Latin percussion, that's mm -hmm. something that you are passionate about. Maybe we hop in with that and talk about yeah. Latin percussion a little bit and then, and then move on from there. Yeah, sure, sure. So my background getting into Latin percussion, and, I, and I'll kind of expound a little bit upon even that, you know, when we say yes. that. Um, but my background is my mom's side of the family is from Puerto Rico. So I, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, though. <laughs> so I grew up with mariachi, tejano, norteño music, a lot of, you know, more in the Western and, and Mexican style music because I grew up in a neighborhood that was basically a barrio. And mm -hmm. but, you know, I my mom's side of the family is from Puerto Rico. So as I got older, I still was exposed, got exposed to, you know, uh, Cuban music uh, because there is a, a, a very close thread with Cuban music in Puerto Rico. Right. The cultures mm -hmm. are very similar. Um, so, you know, I got into salsa and with with that. But there are. What, 20 or 21, I believe, Latin speaking, Spanish speaking nations. OK, so and when we say Latin America, we also include often Haiti, countries like Haiti within that, even though that's a French speaking, French Creole, Haitian Creole speaking nation. So within these 20, 21 countries and territories, you have their own traditions within those countries. You have regions. Within those regions, you have traditional styles of percussion and music. Within those regions, you have several regions. So in a country just like Brazil, you may have dozens upon dozens of genres that when we say Latin percussion is just in this one nation. Yeah. Here in the United States, when we say Latin percussion, because of the ubiquitous nature or pervasiveness of the conga drum and the bongos, we often think of Cuban music. That's where these drums are. Now, they're all of the African diaspora. You know, mm -hmm. this this can be a conversation that triggers a lot of people because they say, that's African. It, you got to say it's Africa. Sure. Well, I think everybody understands. A lot of people know that. So within yeah. the community, so we don't often say that. But it is an evolution of West African music. But uh, Afro-Cuban music, salsa now again, this is this is this can be a debated issue. Again, this is one where people go, "Oh, you can't say that," but it's just as American as American pie, you know. And when you talk about the history of mambo and the golden years and the relationship between the United States and Cuba, especially before the embargo, you can't take out what we hear now of. And salsa is a pop music; it's it's a, it's a genre, you know, but it's yeah. built off of Cuban music, but you when you you have to talk about New York and you have to talk about the technology of the phonograph and recording and so you can't take the United States out of that equation when we talk about from our standpoint when we say Latin percussion yeah. so when we say Latin percussion we're often thinking of the bongos so the congas you know afro cuban music as well as dominican music because of the merengue right bachata music you know juan luis guerra very famous pop uh, artists in the Latin Spanish speaking uh, genres. So um, I, I personally play more than anything else, uh, Afro Cuban, uh, Puerto Rican percussion. So you have the congas, I mentioned the timbales, mm -hmm. you know, various types of cowbells. Uh, but in Puerto Rico, you have also the plena drums, which are a tambourine without the jingles. It's basically a frame drum. And then you have the bomba drum, which is a barrel. It's like a wine barrel turned into a drum. So the barriles. Mm. Um, and then uh, I've also gotten into Brazilian drums over the last few years. Um, but I've been playing conga drums for about 25 years now. So that kind of music is what I've really been into. Sure. But yeah, we could talk about I have some in, oh, right over my shoulder, like right there are some yep. Colombian maracas. So mm. when we think maracas, we think the Puerto Rican style or the Cuban style. But the Puerto Ricans have their own maraca. The Colombians, they have their own maracas. Venezuela, mm. they have joropo. So anyways, yeah. that's a yeah. diatribe. Well, no, that's, but. that's interesting on that 
note just so like there of 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 the study of the instruments yes versus the music being played versus the culture i mean the 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 actual physical percussion instruments there's yes. so many and i've gone down the rabbit hole of like oh. you know posting videos online of like uh, and that that's the same with um like asian cultures where there's yes. so many different varieties and a lot of them aren't like a slight variation of like some drums you go all right that looks like this drum it's a little bit bigger yeah. it's a little bit longer so it gets a different name some of them many of them are just worlds apart do you think cultures are coming up with new instruments at this point or are we I, pretty much I set do. with what we have yes and and you you'll see examples of of instruments coming up that are becoming that are evolving we can take we can go back a little bit farther when we talk about drums and something that could be connected uh, and just talk about the last hundred years. When you look at you and I, when we think about steel drums from Trinidad, we we grew up with they always were there. Yeah. But really, like the drum set, that's a more newer phenomenon that's built on an older tradition, right? Yeah. But but yeah, the and and you mentioned the instrument itself, and and to tie that into ethnomusicology, really, there's a lot of terms we ascribe terms to things that already existed, but. Semiotics is another term that you hear of in the world of, of anthropology and ethnomusicology, which is basically the study of signs and symbols. And when you ascribe it to uh, music, then you have semiotics within ethnomusicology. Now you have what that particular thing. So semiotics as like the instrument. When you and I see a snare drum, a lot of people might just see a drum. We see it culturally from an inside yeah. perspective. But there may not be this connection to grandma and grandpa the way in that heritage going way back the way a guichado, which is a little guido made out of a gourd in Puerto Rico. That may be or the cajon from Peru, where someone who doesn't even play it sees that. And there is a very close nostalgic, very close, deep sense of identity with just the, the shape of yeah. that instrument and the texture and sound of that instrument, right? Interesting. Which actually yeah. leads me something to something that you may appreciate that I think a lot of our listeners will is uh we often say things like music is a universal language. Something that you often hear from people within the field of ethnomusicology is that that is not accurate. Now we know that for the sake of communication, there are music is a phenomenon it's a universal, well, even that, I don't know, it's fully accurate, but it's definitely a universal phenomenon. It happens all over the world, right? Sure. But there are things within music that we don't always understand. And it's kind of like one of those things you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Or we can go as simple as if you take a certain type of music and it's played and it sounds happy to you, it may not sound like happy music in another part of a world. Hmm. So, so you, music in and of itself, we could take, let's take a, an example, the clave, for instance, we were talked about Latin music here in certain parts of the United States, you might hear like a rhythm of the clave, let's say son clave, which is, let's say it's three, two, one, two, three, dun, dun, right? Mm -hmm. We may hear that as just a rhythm and you hear that in Latin music, but you don't have to have that rhythm within the ensemble for it to be prevalent. So the clave, actually, I'll, I'll, as a producer, sometimes I help people outside of the genre get a Latin feel if they want a fusion song. And yeah. there have been times where I'll tell people, hey, I can give you the Latin feel on the percussion, but, and I don't want to, I don't want to overstep my boundaries here, but your bass and your piano are not following that, that clave. So yeah. it's not just a rhythm. But it's actually dictating the entire everybody. It's a key. Clave means key in Spanish. So it's actually the key to what's happening. So yeah, now yeah, if yeah. you just come in and play that over it, someone else in that culture might go, ooh. Uh, and yeah, but the, the person who's kind of a novice, I guess, or just like a, a, a layman would be like, well, I just want a Latin percussion feel, you know, right. like a broad, but... I like what you're saying where it's like, well, there's a lot more to it and there's culture behind it and stuff. And, so and they're we talk probably about, like, just, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. do it. <laughs> and so when we say that the music is a universal language, there can be 
that's true to the sense like I can I can if I'm in China somewhere or West Africa and I have a guitar in my hand and I play and he starts dancing or whatever. We are communicating yeah. something to each other. We're yep. always communicating. But what's communicated isn't always understood the way that I understand it. Once yep. I get that and take that to the next step as a musician, that actually helps me to learn different feels a lot better because now I'm not being ethnocentric. I'm not taking sure. my ethnic background and making the center and then just ascribing a definition on everything. Right. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting. I mean, it's almost like how, you, you know, if I go like, like put my hands to my mouth in a culture, it means like I'm hungry or something like that, or like point to my eyes. It's like, look, look here or like, look there. But there's a million things beyond that. We all know that's yeah. the basic, basic elements of like communication. But uh, that's interesting you say that because that is such a, you know, it's such a happy music is the universal language. It's it's right, happy, right. Though it, but but there is a lot more to it where, yes, that may be the case, but you really do need to dig deeper. It's the universal language, but you can't uh, overlook the what makes everyone unique and what makes each culture I'll give you an example, Important. Bart. There's times where uh, I've had people come from other countries and get almost insulted or really confused. And they'll go to like, let's say a church. They might go to a predominantly black church and they go to a home home going service. Mm -hmm. Right. Which we know it's not just in black churches, but they go and the music's real and they might hear where it's really happy and they're really exuberant. There's times of mourning during that service but it may also be a lot of joy. And that music that's played, some people feel that that's really, uh, what's, I'm, I'm looking for another word, not necessarily insulting, but it's trite and it's not you yeah. know, respectful because in their culture, you gotta be more, maybe it's quiet, more reverent. They'll say reverent. Yep. But in this particular context, reverent may also be attached to, we're celebrating, we believe that that person lived a good life. We want to remember them. And also, there may be a religious aspect. We believe that person is in heaven, and now yeah. they're released from the pain of this world. And yeah. so when you understand it within that context, then it makes sense. Second line drummers. Uh, That's what the, I was thinking. The, yep. Exactly. So there's, there's, there's a lot of that. And when we talk about, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's all throughout the, the world if we're in the United States. But really- the United States is, to me, is it, it's such a fascinating country. We're talking about 50 states and territories, and there's so many different cultures and subcultures, and that just can blow your mind. You're like, I had no, I, I always thought of America as this. Uh, it, there's a video, I'm a big Mark Anthony fan, and there's a video with him and a group called Gente de Zona, which they're like a, a reggaeton group from uh, Cuba. I believe they're from Cuba. And in the in the video, I believe there's all these flags because they're talking about Latin America and and a lot. There's these ladies that are dressed with the flag, different colors like flags. And they have these flags. And there's I believe there's one lady that has like the United States. I believe I could be wrong, but it's still sure. to my point. I personally and there's a lot of people that feel the same way. I see the United States as an extension of Latin America. I grew up in the barrio. You have the Southwest. California was once a part of, of Mexico. Um, so you, depending on where you're at and where you grow up, then it's like, oh, so it's just all of these different ways of looking at things, you know? And yeah. I think as a drummer and a musician, it can really take your ears to that next level because really what ethnomusicologists do, if we want to talk about similarities, is, is learn how to ask questions and to listen. This episode is brought to you by Pocket Percussion in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philly. Pocket Percussion and Mangello Cymbals are having a series release party at the shop on September 8th from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. There will be prizes and raffles, so you won't want to miss it. Pocket Percussion sells used gear, stands, cymbals, custom drums, snares, hand percussion, vintage gear, plus hard to find parts and everyday necessities. In addition to buying, selling, and taking trades, he also does great repairs and reheading. Learn more at pocket-percussion.com and keep up with their newest gear on Instagram and Facebook at Pocket Percussion. So there's two things I'm thinking of. Of 
One being how sometimes the music from America is generalized as Western music. But it kind of seems like what you're saying just blows that out the, the, the window where it's like, well, but there's so many cultures within that. Or you say Eastern music and you think of like traditional, like, I don't know, like stringed instruments that are very, yeah. that has like, a, like an Asian feel to it or something or a Middle Eastern feel. But it's just, it's almost, uh, I don't want to say not fair, but it's, it's over generalizing things where you need to zoom in more and, and study right. it more, you know? Yes. I mean, it's. How, how would you, if, if someone said like, oh, I don't, uh, you know, that's just Western music. How would you respond to something like that about American music in general? Because even pop music seems to have all these roots in it. It's like an onion yeah. that you just have to keep peeling. Yes. Well, exactly. I think the for, for the average listener, perhaps it's not even a musician or a musician that's just been within rock and roll. I think a little bit like you alluded to it a little bit, or I believe you were, uh, would be a, a history lesson and say, yeah. okay. Well, let's go back, but not even too far back. Let's talk about Michael Jackson and they don't care about us. You know, uh, some of these rhythms were were taken from other parts of the world. Sure, we put a backbeat on them. But even when we talk about a backbeat, okay, well, let's talk about boom bap and rock and roll. And let's talk about the the history and the foundation upon that. And when you start doing that, then you start saying, oh, my goodness. Okay. So. The idea, the fact remains is that there's no, I like what um, Ned Sublet, he, he's an author. Hmm. He wrote something in, there's a music called Cuba and it's music, uh, the book, really good book about Cuban music. And he wrote in the beginning of the book, he said, there's no immaculate conception within music. I think that's a really good, for those that are not initiated, yeah. you know, with the Virgin Mary and, um, you know, yeah. just God impregnating a woman, all of a sudden, boom, it's here. That doesn't exist unless you have transcended humanity. Now, I am, I'm quite religious or spiritual person as a Christian, my faith. So I do believe as a spiritual person that music is spiritual. And sometimes people are getting things that are deposited. Even if you're not religious, some people will play, say things like, hey, Stevie Wonder got that from somewhere. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so my, you know, uh, yes. uh, uh, someone's, they've got a special gift that's that, not, that can, normal. that's, that's unique, right? But yeah. there's even, there's no just boom and then it just came. It came from somewhere, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I'll tell you something interesting that happened to me in my, in my, the beginning of my studies of my graduate work was I was reading a textbook. And that's the other thing when we talk about ethnomusicology, when we talk about the history of it. We have to talk about academic institutions, right? Do we preface it? Because what we're really talking about is contemporary current history. Well, over the last maybe 120, 150 years or so. But the the our academic institutions are the framework that are we're talking about here. Because yeah, it existed sure. before we called it that. I was reading a textbook. And now I came into the study as someone thinking the music that I came from as far as uh, music that I grew up listening to that I liked the most, you know? So as a young man, it might've been hip hop. It might've been jazz. It might've been, you know, just a lot of a, a pop music that's prevalent in the United States, even yeah. though I did listen to a lot of other stuff. I'm reading this textbook and it's talking about Western music and it's talking about non-Western music. And man, I had this epiphany. I'm reading a book and all of a sudden, it's talking about non-Western music. It gets into the African-American section. So it starts talking about gospel music, starts talking about jazz, starts talking about blues, you know? And I'm like, wait, wait, <laughs> like that's Western music. Cause I'm thinking yeah. that's just music that came natural to me growing up. My, my, on my dad's side of the family, they were church of God in Christ. You know, he was a, he was a preacher, but that also means that he was a singer, played the piano, my version of Amazing Grace was had a certain sure. pentatonic scale to it. Yeah. That stuff that just comes natural to him that I hear and recognize. So I'm thinking that's as Western as, you know, as Western can be. Yeah. But it really depends on your POV, right? Your point of view. Yep. And so then it was like, oh, I was not thinking about the history of imperialism, colonialism, academic institutions. People now discovering this new world, becoming wealthier as a country, commercialization, European music in the form of classical music, 12-note yep. scale, 
commoditizing this music now, now becoming in a part of a larger commercial economic society and now traveling and now wanting to write about other music. But who Hmm. are these people that are doing that? And it may not have been the African slave, the indigenous person in the United States. So you have, so understand when I saw that and I was like, oh, so there's different, and, and that leads us to different factions and different branches. Cause you know, ethnomusicology is like a, a river and tributaries, different mm-hmm. ethnomusicology. So then I was like, oh, so a lot of the people that were studying the ethnomusicologists came from a more classical music background, a written notation background. Interesting. Yeah. So now when you look at rock and roll, you and I are used to rock and roll and it probably comes natural to us just like that. Yeah. But when you go back just to the 1950s, Little Richard in the 60s and James Brown and whatnot, these are newer phenomenons. You know, I was born in 1978. Yeah. So 1978, I mean, you talk about rock and roll was not was starting not too long before that. Yeah, yeah. But it's not, it wasn't considered Western music, the, the roots of it. As a matter of fact, blues music, that music was not, it was frowned upon hmm. in, here in the United States for yeah. many years before the British invasion and in Elvis Presley that was yep. not played as pop music accepted within our country, hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So when you understand that history, regardless of what your political beliefs and all that, this is just, it is what it is, right? Then it's like, oh, okay, now I can understand these Western terms a little bit more in Eastern terms. But it was shocking to me as a Latino and African-American man that that wasn't that was in the non-Western section of the textbook. And it was like, well, do you think that as you've learned more, it's -hmm. almost like what you said about like what you don't know, you don't know, like as you've learned more and become more. I mean, you've studied ethnomusicology that you then it, it it. May, becomes more complicated for you where you can't just sit there and happily go, oh, this is Western music where it's broken out further. Do you think that it's a little bit more of like you want it to be separated and, and appreciated for each individual piece that it is like instead of just saying, oh, that's Latin percussion, you want to st- say, no, 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 this is this. This is this. Like, do you find that you maybe don't like those over generalizing terms I mean, you have to understand in our yeah. day and age of just communication that it is what yeah. it is. Yeah, but yeah. But are you a little bit more? We should dig deeper on everything. I well, the so there's different sides of me, you know, and uh, the purist and the traditionalist and the culture side of me, of course, wants people to know more. But I also understand that I don't know. I don't consider my now. Here's where maybe the imposter syndrome creeps in, but <laughs> I don't consider myself an expert, even though in Cuban music, even though I've been playing congas and other instruments for you know going on 30 years now i don't consider myself an expert there's one thing to play the instrument it's another thing to be a folklorist even yeah. here in the, this country we have even in in pop music we have folklorists and people that study folk music and know it from a scholarship aspect sure. so but but there's a purist in the traditional side of me but there's also the child in me that's just like look dude i just like music I don't if I'm going walking down the street and I'm I'm in Orlando going to Disney World with my kids and my wife or not. And there's some street, uh, some guys on the side of the plane at Disney World. And there's a guy playing congas. And he I maybe I can tell that his hand technique is different. You know, it's maybe not all that great, in my opinion. Yeah. But it sounds good to me. And I'm vibing. He's got he's expressing emotion. I just love music. I don't really care. That side of me doesn't really care. At the end of the day, you do have to communicate, as you said. So yeah. I do. I don't. I use these terms like salsa. Salsa is a heat. The term itself is a heated debate. Has been for many years. Not as much now because we're kind of over it in some aspects. But <laughs> sure. you know. But but that was a thing there. But at the same time, though, it's like. But what these Puerto Ricans in New York did, they created some yeah. really good music. So there's a lot yeah. of Cubans that aren't necessarily mad at that. There are some that's like, uh, but there's a lot of Cubans that love music. It's a music yeah. country. It just, it per, you know, expresses it. So I feel similar in the aspect that for me, it's like, dude, at the end of the day, you know, and it, I think it's a lot music and language. There's even terms we use in ethnomusicology that have come out of linguistic studies 
um, like emic and etic inside and outside perspectives. But mm. language is highly connected to music because, you know, they they almost become one and the same, even the way we use analogies for for language. And sometimes we we have to use uh, words to to just kind of express we get there and then yeah. we can kind of start discussing it from there. But we need a point of departure. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't be too. It's almost like if someone is too like if you're just trying to have a conversation with someone like you're a very nice guy. If we were just talking or you're talking to a non drummer, you would use broad terms to just not be a a snob. It, it, you a know jerk, what I mean? Man, like, you don't want to be a like, jerk. Oh, you, you're not going to be like, fun. that's not the right term. That's not salsa. <laughs> that's not you. You want it to be like approachable. And then if someone's more interested, which kind of leads me to the question of, you know, without going to down the academic route of like maybe someone's. 15 years old and they're really yeah. interested in what we're talking about they're not getting going to get a master's in this what's a good approachable way for someone who's uh you, you could be 65 years old whatever good approachable way for people to maybe dip their toe into ethnomusicology like how how does one begin the process of again not even on an academic level for work or whatever it's more of just like um just for your own sake of you know the the, the quest of knowledge how do you start that yeah, I think the big thing, number one, is relationships, right? So building relationships and cultivating them and then learning how to listen and ask questions. Uh, like I mentioned, linguistics. There is a close relationship in the ologies of, of people, anthropology, linguistics, with framing a question to someone. So for instance, if you're 15 or 16 years old, and you want to get into maybe you 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 just play prog rock and you don't know, uh, even though some of the prog rock uh, band uh, leaders that you listen to, they may be playing certain stuff in their music, but you don't know how to differentiate it. And you want to learn more. You want sure. to broaden your horizons. There may be someone at your school, right, if you're young or if you're older that you work with that comes from a these cultures or certain cultures. So the first thing is. Just looking at an instrument and maybe looking up the history. We have yeah. we live in such an amazing time where you can Google things now, right? Yeah. So yeah. um, how many times have you or I grabbed an instrument or a word and found out later there's this huge background to that instrument or that word, this etymology, totally. you study of words, and you're like, why didn't I think of it? Wow, it just opened up a whole new world. I think yeah. just by picking up an instrument and then looking up the background of that instrument is a good start. For instance, um, just a lot of young people have no idea where this started, this brush. So sure. those that are listening and not yeah, watching, you're listening, I'm holding a, a, a brush in my hand, like for yep. jet, sh, 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 right? Yep. <laughs> the fact that this came from fly swatters, yep. already it's like, wait, 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 wait. So someone around the turn of, shortly after the turn of century, so the 20s, shortly after 1910s, you could correct me on that, but decided to start. So this hasn't just been forever, but someone who may, who was alive not too long ago was alive, not too long ago, was alive back when this was sure. just becoming a thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but then when you look at how, why did that become a thing? Some people say brushes became a thing because- they were listening to tap dancers, hmm. right? That's what some say. Shh, yeah. The sliding of the feet on. Now it's a debated thing. But so now you have rhythms that sometimes come from a place where you can't take, with music period, you cannot take the social aspect out. Yeah. When you understand, if you're trying to learn a certain feel, you can sometimes get there. Uh, not necessarily quicker because you got to do the work. You got to listen, listen, listen. But sometimes you can get to a quicker bit of understanding when we understand the social aspect behind it. It also leads us to want to talk less and ask more questions. For instance, behind me on this big bass drum, for those that are listening, there's a big bass drum behind me. There's a couple things that are down there. And this leads still on your, your, um, your question. How as a young person, how would I get into, into this? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just looking up some history of the instruments it might really peak. You're already doing that. And since it leads you to new knowledge, it may also inspire you to want to ask more questions. 
let's say you find out that this is from this culture, whatever. Now you might have friends and they're talking and they say, instead of just saying, oh, yeah, that's just Will. That's so and so. It's just like, hey, Will, where did you, you say you're from L.A.? Uh, you, how did you get into this music? Oh, well, how do you view that drum? Do you just view it as just playing a rhythm or, oh, actually, I'm glad you asked that. When I play the conga drums, there's a connection to my grandfather. I yeah. feel like that, you know, my grandfather's from Puerto Rico. He loved rumba music. I'm one of, I have a large family, so I'm not the only percussionist, but I'm one of a few mm-hmm. that play this music and I'm passing that along. And, and I feel that there's also a sense of representation, right? Yeah, So totally. there's that. But what I'm saying is that leads you to asking these questions. So just look at the history. These right here, kakrebs, are basically iron castanets that I'm holding. But they come from Morocco. Now, some Moroccan players have said that where this comes from was from the shackles that were on the slaves. Wow. And the rhythms that are played, clack, 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 come from yeah. the shuffling of the feet. The conga drum, the conga back in the day, bum, 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 comes from the shuffling of the slaves together. If you're walking and one trips, that could be a problem. Oh, so, boy. Wow. So we come up with ways to be together, to survive. Yeah. Now you move up to the bebop era. Similar thing. You move into jazz. You move into the cre- cre- the creoles and, and, and those that are not creoles coming together and why they're coming together and why they're able to make these certain uh, sounds, right? Mm, yeah. When you look at the social aspect of it, then it's like, oh. So now when I go to play... It frees me up to bring in my personality, or now I have an understanding. Oh, that there's angst in this music. There yeah. is there is a, a certain a, a emotional just outpouring from some kind of oppression or joy that's in this music. So now I'm not just seeing it as the page. It frees me up. Right. Yeah. It's it's amazing to me how you can hear things or see things really for so long and then you find out something like that and you go oh i'll never hear that the same again never i'll never hear same. no and then but but you've but you've heard it one way your whole life and then just hearing one little bit of information can change it Boom. even like i i've found it and it's it's not even it, it relates to this but it's like if there's a band and the band is like okay they're pretty good but if your friend is in the band they're ah. great it just changes how you're how you hear things and perceive things. Appreciation. That's leading appreciation. us to music appreciation. Yes. When you have an appreciation for it, then it's like, oh. But you know, it also it also leads us and we want to become good. Like I don't I'm a learning listener. I've learned as I've gotten older, because I'm I'm a some people call me a social butterfly. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm an introverted extrovert. I, yeah, I don't you fall are. in I any lines. That. I don't yeah. fall in all the lines because it depends, you know? Yeah. But, but I love sharing, but I, I'm, I'm very interested in people. And so I want to learn as I get older, how to be a better listener, because even the way you ask a question, and this gets, we talk about ethnomusicology, you have what's called ethnography and you have, which is basically not just the methodology, but writing things down and, and actually, you know, graphing them, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have the methodology of how you get to the transcription of writing. If you understand that a culture is maybe a shame culture or not shame culture, but they come from the aspect of if, if you ask a question, I don't want to offend you. So I might give you the answer I think that you want. You don't want to mm. probe anymore. So that means maybe I need to ask when I'm trying to learn about this music, to say, hey, do you think it would be a good idea if I played this over here? They might be, yes, I that might be that might work. Not instead saying, hey, I found this drum. What do you think about this drum? Can you tell me about this drum? I need to hmm. find a way to frame that so that I get like being a good interviewer, get myself out of the way and not infer information within my questions. So as a percussionist, I may say, well, I don't care about ethnomusicology. I just want to learn how to play tablas or what have you. Yeah. I want to learn why they, I just haven't been able to get to understand this. There might be a bit of information that they don't even realize because it just comes natural. But you have yeah. to f- ask the right way and then it leads you to that information. So there is, um, you know, there's, there's study and there's, there's resources within 
this field like anything else that may open up and go, oh, I would have never thought to ask that way. And that will lead exactly. me to new information. I, I think it's it's interesting. And people are, by listening to this, are doing the first step of, of yeah. learning more. I know I am. I mean, this really is like, you know, I've I've had to get out of my comfort zone a lot in the podcast. And I think for the most part, people are very eager and friendly and want to share the information and uh, don't mind if you ask a question that might not be they, they know that you're learning. You're not going to know everything right off the bat. So it's it's interesting just to kind of put yourself out there. And, um, you know, everyone has a first day of anything and a first time learning something. I'm sure your first time going to class and learning all this stuff. Uh, it, it, it also is just amazing how much information can be out there that we don't even have. an idea. I mean, it's it's mind blowing how much can be out there about. I think that's why drums. A-listers, the higher you go, it seems like the more humble they really are. Because they yeah. realize, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. So on the list here, I'm just looking at different things that we can kind yeah. of uh, talk about here. Um, rudiments in various styles. Because rudiments, when we think about that with drumming, we think of obviously our, our rudiments that we have, our paradiddles and stuff like that. Right. How does that uh, term apply to all these different cultures? Yeah, yeah. So you, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples, right? Um, I'll give you a contemporary example, which still, we may still relate to it when we talk about like Swiss rudiments and, mm -hmm. you know, modern stick, stick control from the modern drummer. But yep. let's talk about, we're talking about Afro-Cuban music, the timbales, abanicos, rolls, open rolls. There are various rudiments that are used that have been used in top, you know, 40 songs, you know, charting songs over the years. Um, and that have become tradition. They become classic models within ensembles, the Latin ensemble, right? And so, you know, it might be a five-stroke role, but it might be a five-stroke role played within clave, or it might be a five-stroke role with a flam drag or something mm -hmm. like that, right? So, yeah. but you might not play that rudiment in a certain part of the song because that's not, wait, wait, that's not where we are. Whereas, hmm. you know, in in another genre, it's just like, well, you just you just improvise. OK, you can. He plays it yeah. this way. I'm just doing like what Stuart Copeland did. I'm feeling it. Yeah. I'm just, just sure. But in a certain context, not yet. Um, there may be uh, rudiments that call for playing more notes that may be for a faster song that in another genre, that's a night song, an evening song, or hmm. it may be a morning song. Right? Interesting. So yeah. the the amount of notes that you play or having to play at a certain speed may cause that whole genre and feeling to change and how we feel about that. Yeah. Uh, when you look at djembe players and conga playing, when I first started playing congas, one of the things that really drew me in other than just the tone of congas, those are my what I call my principal instrument. It's my love, first love with instruments, is... One of the things that drew me in early on was soloists. I think once you, anytime you play an instrument, once you get to a certain degree, unless you're playing like you're a, you're a transcriber or not transcriber, but interpreter, uh, you know, like in a symphony, it, it, those of us that play in bands, we, we really love, you get to a point where you hear people that can just solo and express themselves on the instrument. Yeah. I wanted to be able to express myself on the instrument. And what I found out early on was a couple different aspects. One was rhythm, certain rhythms that, that I was drawn to. But two was this rudimentary knowledge. And there were certain common rudiments based off of the clave and rhythms that conga players were often playing. Whether it was mano secreto, mano secreta, which is just like, you know, that palm, uh, mm -hmm. finger type of deal. Uh, or whether it was bringing in you know, what the bell does, which really rudiment is like language. We talked about linguistics. When we talk about speaking a language, if I want to express myself, the more, if I want to read, let's say that I have to be able to understand syllables. Syllables make up a word. I have to understand and be able to read that word. I have to know a certain amount of words. If I want to be able to read, if I want to write and be an author, I have to be able to know a certain amount of words to express these emotions. Rudiments are like the syllables 
that make up the words, which are like rhythms or sentences. Sure. So we talk about, for instance, in djembe playing, what is the, I think the Swiss triplet, um, something like that. You, you'll hear yeah. uh, variations of that a lot in West African djembe playing. I didn't really think about a lot of these rudiments until later I had to teach them what I was playing and started realizing, oh, wait, I'm doing that with my hands on this instrument. Now, I could play with my hands faster than I can with sticks in my hands. I have some stick control, but there's certain things that I do when I hear a player and I'm like, oh, that, what, what, I kept trying to remember what is this such and such, you know, or maybe a paradiddle flag diddle. I just made that up. You know, but then <laughs> it but sounded then I, real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then I play it and then I'm like, wait, sounds familiar. Then I go to the congas and I go, oh, I play a variation or an iteration of that. Sure. So rudiments yeah. as a percussionist sometimes are the fun fundamental base of a of another world tradition, percussion yeah. speaking. So do you think Kind of just like throwing an oddball question at you here. Do you think there's a benefit at all to not having the ethnomusicology background where you have nothing? You you have no frame of reference. You're creating things totally off of your you're not constrained by yeah. uh the formality of nope, it has to be this, it has to be this. The the ability to make creative things off the top of your head without this this box that you're put in by knowing sometimes you can know too much. Yes. What's yes. your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is that history has already proved that's true, <laughs> right? Yeah. When we look at all of our, our, our elders. Now, granted, like I said, I believe there's no necessarily like immaculate conception when it comes yeah, yeah, yeah. to music, right? Yeah. Um, so it came from somewhere, but the people that were making it were often making things up and then it became a tradition. Whether it's a thousand years old, now that's heritage. That is culture. We can't take that away. We can. We don't want to take that away from people groups at all because it is. But maybe a thousand years ago, there was a forgotten or maybe this rhythm's 400 years old, but there are also forgotten rhythms. We talk about the rumba in various genres in Cuba, but there are many rhythms going back that are no longer played. And even here in the United States, there are rhythms that were once played that are not played. You can go into the Gullah and Geechee uh, border islands, there's a there's a lot of stuff that was played that is no longer played. Mm. So my point is, yes, if you get a guy like Ringo, Jimi Hendrix, Bob yep. Marley, they're free. Yeah, Stuart yeah. There's Copeland, freedom in it. There's totally freedom in it. Sting in the police. Yeah. I mean, would we really have a ska the way music in the in the rock world the way we have it if we didn't have young people that were free to, to kind of build off of the past and and since we're talking about Cuban music, that's what the Cubans have been doing and Puerto Rican, Afro-Puerto Rican music have been doing for years. The music evolves and it has to evolve, which leads us to that age old debate of whether or not we just stick to tradition or we evolve. But we need, they both need each other to coexist. I do yeah. think that there's a freedom and, and that that freedom leads you to the point where now we can build some structure. Now, at my core as a human and my my beliefs, I believe we need some kind of structure and confinement because that gives us freedom. But at the same time, we need within those confines, you know, hey, little Johnny, this is the gate. Don't go outside that gate or you're going to get hurt, right? Yeah. But yep. within that, I have to be careful that I don't give him too much information about certain things so that he, I can find out what is really needed to teach this child something. A yeah. good percussion or drum teacher will often use what I like to call the Bruce Lee method, but it's been around since the beginning of mankind. Each student's different. Sometimes you just, at that first lesson, first few, you just have to evaluate that student sure. and see what's going to work. So when it comes to being a percussionist, I do think that you have a benefit sometimes not having that. Me personally, I think I benefited from number one, not being a professional musician at first. I did mm -hmm. other work. Not saying that I'm better than a musician that didn't do music at first. It just, it benefited my path, right? Yeah. So I don't get too caught up and I don't take myself too seriously with the music and I, because I was a mechanic before yeah. I was a musician. So I yeah. also know, hey, at the end of the day, bro, you're playing bongos, right? You're not working <laughs> on the nuclear bomb, right? <laughs> yeah, it sure. doesn't mean it's less important though. 
It doesn't mean it's less important, but it yeah. gives me a frame of reference, yeah. right? Yeah. So I do think that, and and for me, learning from the street first and then learning to read and write and becoming a technician, I have seen where be getting too deep into the technical parts have hindered me. I know what that feels like. Yeah. And then I have to go back to the experiment because sometimes that's, sometimes when we get into writer's block, really that's all it is, is we got too much into one frame of thought. We yeah. got too much at like a technician. I mean, ignorance is bliss, as they say, where, and sometimes these, these, like you hear a non drummer play who will like open their hi hat on a certain, what they're playing the drums where it's like, I would uh, never do that. I would yeah. never do that like ever. And you just did it without even thinking. And it's technically it's or wrong, like a Jay Dilla, right? A producer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Where it's sliding and it's kind of off, but it's, but it's right. And it's good. And you oh, need people man. to like make those mistakes that, that, uh, that, that are, that are not mistakes. They end up being a cultural phenomenon. Right. Um, on that note, as we kind of get close to wrapping up here, I want to ask you, are there, and, and you don't have to name names, but are there certain like songs or styles or things that happen in your field with other professionals that drive people nuts where they like, uh. there's a certain song that has this style of whatever conga. And it's like, that doesn't belong there. He's playing that wrong. She's playing like, is there something where you guys have an example of like, um, oh, this, this nineties kind of music used this kind of sound. Yeah. And it drove everyone insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one uh, that is, it's a funny one, is the cowbell thing, right? <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm cool with it, man. It brought a lot of awareness to the cowbell. But when Will yes. Ferrell did the cowbell skit, which is one of the greatest skits of all time, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, it's like, I cannot pick up a cowbell without somebody saying, yeah. That's what we need more cowbell. But if you ever, the cowbell is a very serious, in fact, you don't have, in West African music, you don't even have certain genres without the bell pattern. You know, mm. when you talk sure. about a 6 8, uh, that kind of rhythm might sound familiar to people, but that comes from a bell pattern too. And some mm. rhythms are going into bell patterns. But so that's one thing. That's a good one. The the the, the, the <laughs> bell the the, the, the cowbell is a serious instrument, y'all. Yeah. But but it's funny too. It is. I get it. It is. But I've heard that those like Will Ferrell and Christopher Walken. I've heard them say I think somewhere that that like ruined their lives. Like people oh, just yeah. saying that to them. So so. But but again, it's like it's culturally it's made it more. You know, it's the cowbell. You know, you. But people yeah. do think that's a prime example too of thinking. You know, whatever. Oh, it's just a cowbell. There's nothing a to it, right? There's, There's nothing, nothing to it. To it. But there's so much history to every um, you just got you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper into everything, everything, everything. I meet people. I have a few cajones back there and yeah. I meet people still to this day that didn't know. And I don't I don't get it. people sometimes say, I'm sorry. Will. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to get offended. Dude. Sure. I didn't know a lot of stuff. I don't know a lot of stuff. So but there's still people to this day that think, oh, that was just a box drum that was created for churches to play acoustic music. Yeah. Not knowing when they find out this history, they're like, oh, my goodness. Wow. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things that, man, I could, the list can go on. <laughs> I will say one, one thing that, um, that I think ethnomusicology is beautiful for is building bridges. I think it is a diplomatic uh, a thing. Uh, it can build bridges with people. I can't tell you how many times because I, I, I'm a fan of the tone, the Iranian tone Bach. You know, the mm. Persian tone bach or tablas. Yep. And I tell someone and we get to talking. I try to be careful. You got to be careful about this. I don't want to just meet somebody from some part of the world and go, oh, I play such and such. <laughs> then it can get kind of weird, right? Yeah. Be that yeah. guy. But as we get to talking, I may bring that up. And I can't tell you how many times that that glisten in the eye that just like, wait, you it's know respect. about the tone just bach? How do you know about my music? And yes, yeah. now we have built a bridge because that person now feels seen, yes. you know? So yeah. I, I think there's a lot of uh, build, bridge building and diplomacy that can go along with that. But um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that goes back to the, the, the broad music is a universal language uh, statement of, yes, we all like it. It all, it makes us all happy. It's a sign of, oh, you, you like my music? 
Yes. That's thank you very much. That that's that's universal. But then again, as you go deeper, it it gets more and more uh, narrow. But but I yeah. do think it's a way of culturally um, of just showing respect and 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 just really like we most people in the world like music. You know what yeah. I mean? It it is yeah. generally yeah. not everyone likes the same food. Everyone likes a pleasing sound. Notes put together in a certain order usually uh, usually mean something similar to everyone. But even what you said earlier. What's happy here might be sad there. So you got to right, because we have the 12 note scale, but it could be a Turkish makam or it could be a uh, it could be a gamelan or, uh, you know, it could be a different yeah. type of modal scale where half steps make it up. It could be an equidistant scale, sure. uh, you know, and even here in the United States, when guys like Thessalonius Monk were building these modes and borrowing notes from other places, there were a lot of people that was like, what are you doing? <laughs> You know, you can't do that's not right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this is like if you feel passionate about what you're doing and and uh, and you're doing something new, you, guys, you sometimes you have to be um, you just have to push forward. Yes. And, you know, I think a lot of things happen one way and that sometimes it needs the guy or girl to just be like, well, I'm going to go this way and keep your head down and keep working and move forward. Yeah. And um, and and it usually it'll pay off, you know, in the end to be stubborn yeah. sometimes. Mm hmm. Yep, yeah. Yep. Will, this has been awesome, man. I just love doing this, uh, these kind of episodes where it, it uh, you know, get a little out of my comfort zone, learn about things that I didn't know about, uh, learn about a literally a study, like a college degree <sighs> that I wasn't really <laughs> too familiar with. Um, but as we wrap up, is there anything that you want to plug? You can tell people where they can find you, website, all that good stuff. Man, I really appreciate that, Bart. First of all, thank you again for having me on. Uh, I am on Instagram, uh, William Johnson Music. I'm on TikTok. Uh, that's a recent phenomenon for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, William me Johnson Muse. Just don't finish. The, well, like, yeah, just don't finish music. So M-U-S, <laughs> William Johnson, M-U-S. Got it. Uh, and then there's uh, my website, williamjohnsonmusic.com. And okay. uh, YouTube is probably the biggest thing that I do is, is, is like the center of what other than my website, which is also William Johnson Music. So uh, if those of you that are not watching or seeing what I look like, you'll you'll see a guy. Uh, most of the time I have a goatee and probably wearing a hat that's playing <laughs> congas or bongos because William Johnson is a very common name. And there's a couple William Johnsons. Sure. I don't want you to think that I am. <laughs> no offense, <laughs> not slinging mud at anybody. But, no, uh, you no, know. no, no, no. And yeah. I'll share those links in the description yeah, for all yeah, this. Yeah. And um, and like I went to your YouTube page and very not that like you know I love having all kinds of different people on here, but you you got to vet a little bit and say like all right you know it's it's easy to say you want to come on and talk for an hour about a topic, but in like thirty seconds I saw your your room what you were doing and I was like yeah okay he's legit oh. <laughs> uh, he knows what he's doing so so it's awesome but um William has been kind enough he's going to stick around after we finish this and we're going to talk about an interesting topic about. Uh, oh, yeah drummers playing with other percussionists. I, yeah. I have been in two bands that have had uh, percussionists, which, um, you know, it's it's definitely, it's a thing. Like stepping on toes. Are you mm -hmm. going to play now? Am I going to play now? Um, you know, it's, we're all in the same world. We should be able to live together, but it's definitely got some interesting uh, uh, relationship kind of stuff. We got to work together. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you want to check those out, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, Patreon link, click it, uh, two bucks a month and up. And there's some new tiers on there that you can check out and uh, hear awesome stuff from people like William Johnson. So, um, William, my friend, thank you for taking hey. the time to be here. This Appreciate awesome. you, Bart. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to have you back later. Maybe, you know, next year or something. Think wow, of some yeah. other topics and you would I'd be happy to have you back. I would be honored.